I was told yesterday that my voice did trail off every now and again, and some of you in the back may not have heard some of what I said. So it's up to you to kind of do something like that when you don't hear me. And um, I'll try to keep an eye on it. Um, all right, uh, just a little a recap of what we looked at yesterday. Um, some examples of where ocean color has been used along with models. And there are a few that we haven't discussed yet, and we'll try to get to those today. Um, so we discussed um, a little bit, and it was a whirlwind, so I apologize for that, but a whirlwind tour of what a numerical model is, how it's constructed, um, an introduction to data analysis, um, a discussion a little bit about what sort of model to use when, so the understanding there are different kinds of models, um, and they all have their uses. Um, some examples of, of ocean color model studies. And then we had a discussion about phytoplankton diversity. And along in that discussion, we saw that there was a little bit of a mismatch between the PFTs that you are getting from ocean color products, or optical products, and what the models are actually using um, and how the models are constructed. And so that there's a little bit disconnect um, sort of between the two communities. And that uh, um, lack of dialogue between the communities can lead to problems. They can lead to models trying very desperately to get diatoms in a certain place when actually it may not be diatoms, it might be some artifact of a, of a, um, a PFT algorithm. And we're going to continue some of those thoughts today. Um, so again, just a, a slide that you saw partly yesterday. Um, the models are constructed in time stepping, so we say something like biomass. Um, is equal to the biomass at a time previously, growth, loss, transport, and transport is important, times however much time it is between time one and time two. We write the equations for the biomass, I showed you this equation yesterday, but also for all the other important pieces in the model, such as the resources, so that might be phosphate, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, iron, a grazing term, so that's all the things that eat the phytoplankton, some detritus, so we may have some dissolved organic matter, we may have some particular matter, organic matter, so equations like that. And if you like things pictorially, what we're looking at is resources, nutrients being eaten by the phytoplankton, those being eaten by zooplankton, detritus. Okay? So in the models, usually that biomass is represented as carbon because most of the biogeochemical models really care about carbon. In the end, they kind of get themselves funded by saying, oh, I'm going to see where carbon goes in the ocean. How, what is the export? Things like that. So usually the models, their base currency is carbon. They'd also need to have the nutrients in them, as, you know, knowing what the nutrients are in them as well, so that they will also have pools of things like nitrogen. So how much nitrogen comes out of the water and into them is stored there. They also then have chlorophyll. Right. Now, some of the earlier models, if I go back 10, maybe 15 years, actually it was just assumed that there was a, a constant ratio. If you had so much carbon, you had so much chlorophyll. Obviously that's not true, and we've learned a little bit from that, and so we actually do, usually in these models, have some flexible co carbon to chlorophyll. So depending on the conditions, depending where you are in the water column, how much chlorophyll you will have relative to the amount of carbon you have. Okay. We call them state variables because we have an equation for each of these. Okay, so I've only got a few of them up here, but there'll be an equation for chlorophyll as well. So it is something that is inherent in the phytoplankton, it's kept, and we know at every time step, at every location, for every phytoplankton type that we have in the model, what the chlorophyll content is. With me? Right. And I'll come back to that. And I'll call it in -sit model in situ chlorophyll because it is the actual real chlorophyll in the phytoplankton. So then I started making up this table, and I'm going to go through the model column first. What is the base currency of a model? Well, I just told you, usually it's ca carbon. Some models might use nitrogen, some actually maybe might use phosphorus, but mostly it's carbon. We have chlorophyll, mostly we have it being flexible, so chlorophyll is actually a state variable. It gets moved around and it changes with, with light and nutrient stresses. If we want to know primary production, it's really easy. We know the biomass. We know the growth rates, and that for us is net primary production. Phytoplankton carbon, as I just said, it's a state variable. It's actually the implicit main thing. So now let's switch over to what ocean color products produce. I wasn't sure what to put there. I started off with remotely sensed reflectance, and then I got a bit nervous. Anyone have any other ideas what I should put there? I mean, me, for me, going to a NASA website and trying to download the base thing, it's 
remotely as disinfectants, but I think maybe you might have some other ideas. But how about chlorophyll? I've put the answers there, so you can tell me. You know already. It can be an algorithm, an algorithm based on the green to blue um, ratio of reflectance. Um, we could, it could be something like QAA, something more semi-analytical. But it's a product. It's derived from, well, the base current seal, which, let's say, is remotely sensitive reflectance. Then how about primary production? <coughs> if you think about it, usually there is some uh, term which might have chlorophyll in it. So it's derived yet a second time. And then how about phytoplankton carbon? I didn't even try to put that down because it was like, yeah. But it's derived from a, deri from a derived quantity. OK, you see the problem. You see the problem. So there is a disconnect between what the models need, use, and what the ocean color products produce. But there are other issues too. So that's what those two are. Most models just bring in par. It's white light between 400 and 700, and that's all they see. And they just attenuate it crudely, and I'll show, it, show you the equation, down through the water column. They're not aware that, well, the models are aware, but they do not include the fact that light has spectrally dependent, and that is important for the phytoplankton. Um, most don't differentiate phytoplankton in terms of their pigments. You can't really if you don't resolve spatial uh, products. All right, am I still talking loud enough? No one's waved? Good, okay. Um, all right, so they're distinct problems. Um, and a bit of dialogue between the modeling community and the ocean colouring community is, would be wonderful. I, I think if we both knew what we wanted and what our uncertainties were, um, it, would, it would be good. All right, so the two things I am going to talk about today is one is several models that are attempting to improve how they treat light and try to come closer to what ocean colour products produce. And then I'm going to kind of completely switch, switch topics. Um, whoops. Sorry, somehow that slipped in. That should be climate. We're going to then talk about climate change. I don't know where that came from. Sorry, it was an old, older, much older version of the model of the talk. Okay, so two topics, um, and we'll see how quickly I can get through those. So first, how do most biogeochemical models treat light? All right, I already said they don't resolve the fact that it's spectral, and they just use an equation like this: the light at any depth is equal to the light at the surface and then an exponential attenuation by, and actually I probably put, should have put C in here, it's encompassing everything. Um, something to do with how water absorbs light and how chlorophyll absorbs light. Okay, relatively crude. And this is then just a, a, a transect, the AMT transect, and a, almost all the depth latitude figures I will show today will be along this transect. So if you can keep that in mind, if you see depth, latitude, it's through the North Atlantic. South will always be here and north will always be there. So this is exponential, I mean, a, a logarithmic scale, the amount of power, and this is how it looks in most biogeochemical models, taking into account the chlorophyll that is actually in the phytoplankton types and the depth. And of course, you have to make some assumption what AW is, given the fact that it's actually absorbing all light um, through all the spectrum. OK, so that's what most models do. They don't really have IOPs. They just have some attenuation. They don't resolve the spectral irradiance. And I should be careful. There are one or two that do try and have at least one or two bands. Um, most of them don't have any radiator transfer. It's just some exponential um, function. And the, a lot of them do not even care about the bottom. Who knows what happens? The bottom light just disappears down there. But there are a few models. Um, and these are as many as I know. and. People can tell me if they know of others um, that are trying to actually incorporate a little more in more important pieces of the, the light issue. Um, you can start off with Ecosim, which was in 1999, because it was the first one I know that really tried to include IOPs and the fact that there was some spectral irradiance. Um, most of the work um, he did was in one dimension, and I actually haven't seen any newer work um, by him. So, um, but. Um, he was very actually influential in a lot of what I've done, so I'll put him up there. Second one I want to mention, and now we're looking into the, to the middle of, of last decade, um, is Cosine. Um, 
which um, Fei Chai out of the University of Maine is sort of spearheading the actual development of the um, uh, ecosystem. But he's been working with Kurt, um, and they've put Ecolite in the model. And I should, I should really sort of preface here to say you couldn't really run Hydrolite in a three dimensional model. It would take that long. Well, probably longer than it takes nature to do the simulations. <laughs> So, so we need to do, if we're going to have radiator transfer, we really need um, to reduce it. So the, the, uh, um, what Kurt and Faye have done in this, um, in this model is put in eco light. Um, and it's an option. If, if they want to run it slightly faster and don't really care about the light field, they can just use the exponential attenuation again, so multipurpose. I'm not going to say anything about this for the rest of the talk because Kurt is going to talk about the work that he's been doing on that in the next lecture. So the next um, three m models, um, one is by Watson Gregg out of NASA. Um, and being NASA, he obviously was caring about trying to connect to chlorophyll. Um, and so yes, he included um, uh, IOPs. Yes, he included spectral irradiance. Um, his direction of doing it, of, of getting a radiator transfer quickly, um, economically, computationally economically, was to have a three-stream model. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Because I've really just copied what he's done. So this is my model. Um, I have IOPs. Yes, I include spectral. And then I have, again, the option to for things that don't really care about light. I can just have an exponential attenuation, but I have a three-stream radiator transfer code. There's also some very exciting work, um, and this is fairly new, um, by uh, Mark Baird um, and Emlyn Jones at, at uh, CSRO in Tasmania, something called E-Reef. And um, uh, yes, they have IOPs. Yes, they have spectral irradiance. No, they don't have uh, um, radiator transfer, but I'll show you that they get around that a little bit. And um, the work is so cool that I couldn't help resist throwing in a few slides about it. So you'll, get to, you'll mostly get to hear about my work, because it's my work. But, We'll talk a little bit about this too. And then Kurt will go on on this one. Yeah? Do you know what Piskes is doing? So Piskes, as far as I know, they resolve two or three wave bands, but just through attenuation. So they just have different, a different um, C for the different. As far as I know, they, if they've done new developments, I, I'm not aware of it. Three wave bands. In the second version. Yeah. Could you repeat what is a three stream model? Um, Yes. Okay. <laughs> and as I was, as I was putting this together, I was like, oh, actually, you know, all right. It's three streams because we have a down, direct, and a down diffuse. So those are two streams really coming in, and we resolve an upward stream as well. So those are just the three streams that we actually resolve. Um, so we have absorption and scattering. The idea is that when you scatter, you go into the diffuse. You either go down with the diffuse stream, or you scatter upwards with the upwelling stream. Um, so this is what we've put in our model. And I, if you haven't noticed, I changed to R very quickly there because I work with some very intelligent people who actually did the work. So you can't ask me too many really complicated questions. Um, so um, the work, this three stream is adapted from AS 87, Eccleson 1994, and then what Watson Gregg has done in his model. Um, the boundary conditions, and so that's what's coming in at the surface, I'm assuming is given. So I assume I know what sort of spectral light is coming in at the surface. It's from a product called OSSIM, which is the Ocean Atmosphere Spectral Irradiance Model, and their products are available online if any of you were ever interested in finding uh, uh, climatologies, or actually I think he does from like 1998 to, to current day, um, daily and monthly climatologies of spectral light. Um, spectral irradiance um, just below the surface of the water. So the equations for that three-stream three model are here. This is the direct, the diffuse, and the upwelling. Um, it makes some horrible assumptions. Um, I guess I didn't realize just how horrible they were until I sat through uh, um, the first few lectures here. Um, but what um, Oliver, who is the um, technician who have really worked on this um, has found a way to solve these with a Gaussian elimination. So he can actually at every time, every place in the model, give, uh, give me what ED, ES, and EU is. 
So then I worked with another really nice person who actually knows what she's doing, and that's Anna Hickman. And we came up with what the IOPs should be in the model. Um, so what we get from OSM, so this is the product of the light just below the, the irradiance, just below the surface of the water, in a, down, a direct downstream and a um, diffuse downstream, is light, is, is, is um, irradiance in uh, 13, 25 nanometer wave bands. And then that water is absorbed, scattered and backscattered. And then we had to make some assumptions about what those were. Um, so this, on this side here is the absorption and the scattering by water. And I think we started off with Pope and Fry, and I think we've moved to, uh, is it Smith and, Smith and Baker is the, ba Baker and Smith, yeah. anyway. Um, we have CDOM, an exponential function. We have detritus, so that's all the dead organic matter in the, fight, in the model that is um, scattering and absorbing. And then here's what we do with the phytoplankton. This is on this side is how they absorb, and on this side is how they scatter. And this is work that Anna did um, with a lot of consultation with Darius um, on choosing these particular spectra. Um, so we actually have nine optically different phytoplankton. So each of these colors here is a different phytoplankton that you probably can't see, but there's a Cynococcus, a high light and a low light pro. So let me see, that's the high light pro. That's the Cynococcus. Um, and then we have scattering that's different for each of the phytoplankton too, based on well, based on lab work on, on these. Any questions on any of that? So they become now state variables. <coughs> no. So these are these are. Um, oh, they're inherent properties of the phytoplankton. <laughs> so every so the phytoplankton has a carbon a carbon biomass and a chlorophyll biomass. This is uh, chlorophyll. This is meters squared per milligram of chlorophyll in this one here. So if there is one milligram of chlorophyll in a hyperlight prochorococcus, then it will absorb light um, this times that one milligram of chlorophyll per meter cube. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So do you have a carbon associated with each of those groups? I have a carbon associated and a chlorophyll associated with, yeah. And actually, it, there's sort of choices that we made, and um, actually I'd be interested to hear various people's opinion about how we did it. This one is actually per chlorophy by chlorophyll. The scattering we actually made per carbon, so we decided it was the body itself, not the chlorophyll, the pigments that were important, so we chose to do that. This, this is um, uh, multiplied by the uh, carbon content. And to the combination of the scattered, are you, are you computing from the top to the bottom? If we imagine a 1D, one d so, so at every location, maybe it's better if I have this. So remember the grids that I drew up yesterday? So let's assume this is the top grid. Um, so everything absorbs and scatters sort of in the center of the grid. Make sense? So um, the scattering happens here, and that's what depends what goes down and what comes, well, what goes up, I guess. And then what comes down is then scattered by what's in the water column here. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's done in a 0D. Yeah. Yeah. feedback to the, to the president. Yeah. So well, well, there is, because if there's backscattering, it goes into this light here. OK, OK. Yeah. OK, that was my question. OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah. It's a bit unclear for me why in this three stream you really need to care about EU. I mean, uh, yeah. upwelling? Yeah, but if you get ED and you, you might just transform that relatively uh, simply in a. Well, in a yeah. Or so, so I think when we initially started doing this model, I had a similar question as my, my, all I cared about was um, what sort of light the phytoplankton were getting because all I cared about was how they grew. But once I had EU, it's like, I can get reflectance. I can get reflectance. Yeah. And that's so, that is why, and I'll get to that. Uh, it, it looked to me a bit like it was taking care of something relatively minor with respect to the other simplification, which are relatively significant. Right. Um, and you know, when we started with the three stream model, I knew very little about um, any kind of radiative transfer. 
And I, I, I would agree, it's like, but it's small, why do we care? But in the end, in the end we kept it because we were like, actually, we can start getting something at the surface. And yeah. So just to give you a little bit more of a feel of the model, um, this is, I have nine phytoplankton op uh, optical types. I'm actually only not showing them all, but this is uh, uh, the biomass in milligrams carbon per meter cubed. Right? I could have put up the chlorophyll instead, but I, that's what I, I plotted. So low light pro, high light pro, syn, pico eukaryotes, coccolithophores, diatoms, trichodesmium, and a unicellular diazotroph. As in most models, the biggest difference between them that really sets this biogeography is how I treat the growth as a function of nutrients. So remember my talking about the Michaelis menten, so this is nutrients. On this axis, this is growth rate. And they each have a slightly different maximum growth rate and a slightly different how they treat, um, how they grow at low, um, at low nutrients. And a lot of that is what sets this pattern of where these different phytoplankton live. By the way, this is the, a transect through the North Atlantic, um, so um, depth to 200 meters. So you can see that there is some very definite uh, depth structure. The depth structure is really helped by the fact that each of these phytoplanktons also have an optical um, signature. And I'll show a little bit of some of that in a little while. Um, so it's kind of cool, I thought. We now have a model that actually is doing, trying to do something that's more realistic about how the light is treated. Okay, so why, why go through all this effort? Um, I think you could all see why, because it's more realistic. I mean, the biology has got to be better if you treat the light in the way it should be. Um, and we'll go through some other pieces of that, but just to sort of prove the point. Here is a model where it's, it's my nine phytoplankton type model, so everything is the same in that. But now I have run it without spectral light. Um, no, no, I, um, no IOPs, I'm just doing what most models do, which is just a attenuation of light. I'm showing chlorophyll as a, um, so again, along the transect with depth. And I'm showing chlorophyll, and the black there is the 1% light level. Now let's add to some IOPs, but let's still only have one wave band. So that's from um, 400 to 700. Okay, so it's beginning to look a little more interesting. You know, the, the fact that IOPs are changing, there's you know, less CDOM here. We're allowing a little more light down um, to depth. Now let's go the full hog. We've got the spectral light, we've got the, uh, um, all the uh, IOPs. And we get a much more, and this at the bottom, by the way, is the observations from this transect. And we can see that this is looking much more like the observations than either of these previous. Um, mm -hmm. How much did it improve? Like, As a, As a R squared. Um, actually, you know, I never, I haven't done, well, that's a tough one to do because I could do an R squared for these, this transect, um, but how many transects are there? I can't do it over globally. Um, so yes, it would be a good, and I actually haven't done an R squared for just this, but um, it would be difficult to do it everywhere. As, and, um. So are you initiating the model with the distributions of phytoplankton? Uh, no, so the way I initialize it is, um, initial all, I, all the phytoplankton with similar biomasses as a function of depth. I usually start them, I, um, it doesn't matter actually how I initialize them, the, the results usually come out the same, but it's a small biomass with some depth dependence um, and it, you know, there's more, I start with more biomass here and less biomass there because I don't want to give the nutrients too much of a, a thing. But, but for initialization, I, I make it, all the phytoplankton are the same and I let them decide then where they want to grow. How much time is it for this to stabilize and get um, Usually about two to three years is enough time. Um, what I'm showing you here is a fairly coarse resolution model. It's, it's one degree, and I can run 10 years overnight. So I can actually do quite a lot of these 
that make that, does that make all sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can actually do several iterations to try and see how it improves. As soon as I go to the coarser resolution, the one that all the pretty movies are made of, it still takes two years, but it might take a month to get those two years <laughs> the results. So, um, okay, but if you improve the biology and a more realistic light, you're obviously then also going to change the distribution of the phytoplankton. So the nice thing about having this inside a fully consistent model and so I say consistent, not right, all models are wrong, but the model is consistent within itself, is that you can then start looking at how important the light field is for what types of phytoplankton live where. And I threw this in this morning, so I apologize. I was just like, it's such a cool experiment, but um, I'm probably going to go on too long now. But I showed you this distribution. Oops. This distribution. So now if I look, and I'm going to look along this transect, I'm going to say which is the most dominant phytoplankton in each, each grid cell. And that's what I'm going to plot here. All right, so look at this one first. Depth, latitude. And I'm showing just which phytoplankton is most dominant in each location. So if it's green, it's one of the Prochorococcuses is dominating. Where it's yellow, it's a Cynococcus. Where it's blue, it's a Picoyuc. I have coccoliths down here, and I have diatoms here. Notice that I've kind of washed it out as the biomass gets really small, just so, you know, this is dominance, it's not biomass, so just keep that in mind. But then I can say, how important is the light field um, for getting this distribution? So I did two experiments, one where I didn't allow CDOM to actually absorb anything. So we have light penetrating much lower in the water column. And you can see a big shift in the types of phytoplankton that are there. Here I made there be way too much AC dump, so we really lift the white column up here. And you can see there's just huge abundance of the Cynococcus, and the Cynococcus are really absorbing quite well in this region, and so they just take over when the, when the light column is, is that shallow. So the nice thing about having it, again, in, the, in a three-dimensional model is that the feedbacks can happen. You can actually see how things will change if the, um, if the light field change. And so, just as a, a thought, what happens in a future world if there's more CDOM, less CDOM? There's going to be a change in the types of phytoplankton that will exist. So it's a beautiful laboratory for thinking about that. And I'd like you to catch, as I go through this, keep thinking, oh, I, this isn't a question I could ask the model. This is another question I can ask the model. OK, um, so it improves biology. It, it's a nice labor laboratory to explore that. It also is a way that models can now maybe better connect um, with the ocean color products because we're actually resolving stuff that's more like ocean color products. Um, and this is actually a question that I think Kevin asked yesterday. Um, and so let's have a look. Again, looking along the transect, this is the observations from the AMT of chlorophyll and nitrate. And typically, when I normally ran a model, that's what I could compare against nitrate chlorophyll. But now I can compare against AC DOM and against phytoplankton absorption. Things that there may be more of observations of than um, of other things. This is some work that Anna has been doing with the model output that I thought was actually super cool. These are the absorption spectra of each of the phytoplankton, but she can decompose that into the different um, pigments. Sorry, that didn't come out too well, but there's the different pigment structures here. So she knows how much of each diatom there is. She knows what pigments they are. So she can then construct a, a, a map now of chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, chlorophyll C, and various other axillary um, pigments. And she can compare that to what is found along the AMT transept. And why that's really cool is that I showed you the plot of all the different phytoplankton I had in my model and their biomass and where they were. I had very, very, very little to compare that to. I actually had just a few picoplankton um, transects to actually compare it to. But if I could suddenly start comparing it to all the pigment data there was in the world, I'd have a far larger data set to go with. Back to uh, David's question. Why bother about this? going to run. It's reflectance from the model. 
Uh, the colour bars are kind of small, but they're not, um, they certainly look something like real world. So that's 475 and 500. I'm going to leave that up because it's so cool. I mean, it's taken something like six years of my life to get there, so I can enjoy it. And actually, I have to admit, I was sitting in the back yesterday and thinking, ah, oh, that'd be really nice to have a movie of that. So Oliver Yarn, who works with me, made that yesterday. And so first time I've actually seen these uh, play like this. OK. So I'm now going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to come back to my model, because I've worked hard on it, and I might as well show you my results. But I just wanted to show you some of the results from um, the E-Reef uh, model. Oh, and I kind of covered it up. That's been done in, at CSRO Australia. And I stole the slide. I was going to ask him if I could use it, but I'm just stole it, so I'm sure he'll. I, all of this is in a paper anyway. Um, Better Al in Environmental Modeling and Software, 2016. They also include IOPs, but they don't have a radiative transfer model, but they wanted reflectance. And so the way they did it is they're assuming that reflectance is equal to this, which I think you've all seen in the last few days, where U is BB over A plus B. So the fact that they have the IOPs, they're just using that to be able to get the reflectance. So here is reflectance in their model uh, for 488, I think. 547. So this is the Great Barrier Reef of here, and here. And this is um, from um, MODIS. So they have a model that covers this region. And what they're actually showing here is, true, is simulated true color now. So they're putting all their reflectances together to get a true color image. And this is it on the 25th of January 2011, on the 2nd of um, February on the 8th of February. And what happened on the 2nd of February is this happened. So if you wanted to know the water quality of the reef during this hurricane, you'd be a bit out of luck. But the model can tell you something, and it can tell you about all of the suspension. Most of this was resuspension of matter. Some of it was what was coming in of the rivers. But by the time there was another true image that they could look at, it has settled down again, so you would have no knowledge of all that resuspension. You might guess, obviously, but there was no true, you know, sort of uh, di direct knowledge of the actual resuspension. So it provides an incredibly um, powerful tool for the for monitoring of of the Great Barrier Reef in this uh, case. I will I will mention that model once more, but it's really cool. If you want to go, it's a really fun paper to read. Um, I'll just remind you of it. Um, it's Bad at Al and it's in um, Earth Modeling Software. OK, so back to the fact that we now have better things to, um, ob to uh, relate to. So I can, model, I can compare my model reflectance to the reflectance that I get from MODIS or CWIFS, anything like that. But I can go a step further. So you're all familiar with the getting a blue-green ratio and getting chlorophyll out of it, right? You've seen it to death. Let me go through it. You get reflectance, you plop it through this algorithm, and you get chlorophyll. OK, so why can't I do the same thing? I have modeled reflectance. I can pop it through the same algorithm, and I can get chlorophyll. OK. Now, I'm going to call this model satellite-derived chlorophyll. Because remember, I have chlorophyll anyway. I know what the chlorophyll is. Now I'm getting a chlorophyll product that's just from reflectance. I can say, how do they compare? Your model reflectance, though, is ED over EU over ED, not RRS. Right. So I have done a conversion. In fact, in this case, it, I have done a conversion using a bidirectional um, coefficient, the Q factor. Um, and in fact, because it's a ratio, and I've assumed Q is the same, and there's definitely some, some issues with that. but. I was going to skip over that bit you caught it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's something we haven't quite figured out on how, how to do the best way possible. But. And are you doing the maximum band ratio, or is it strictly 450 to 5? No, I'm doing the maximum. Um, and I forget which is it, 425, 450, and 475. I'm, I'm in 25 nanometer bands, yeah. Um, and actually, I'll come a little bit more. I, I even delve a little more into it. So, um, But 
If I compare, so this is the in-situ chlorophyll. This is what is actually in all of those phytoplankton. And I compare it then to, um, I think, MODIS I compared it to. This is my bias. It actually looks quite huge in some regions. My model is way too high in these regions, a little bit too low in that region. Now if I compare my model satellite-derived chlorophyll to MODIS, um, you can see a big change in the, di in the um, bias. It turns out this one is, better, is biased better. Bias, does that make sense? Bias better. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be. But what it says is that when I compare my model real chlorophyll to a satellite derived thing from MODIS, I'm not really comparing the same thing. And so I'm going to say they're apples and oranges, really. It's an English expression for any one of those who don't. And then I would say it's not really apples and oranges. It's maybe more like ar oranges and, um, and tangerines or something, something closer to an orange. Um, but it's not the same thing. So if I spent hours agonizing that I've just got way too much chlorophyll in the Southern Ocean, and I haven't read all the papers that say the OC4 is probably biased positive and negative in the, uh, um, ups in the um, Southern Ocean. I could spend a lot of time and mess my model up, whereas in fact, actually, it's not as badly off. Just coming back to the e-reef people, so I've been working on a publication about this, super excited about it. And then I look in a journal, and someone's beaten me to it. This is the e-reef model, and they've done the same thing. They've taken their, reflectan uh, their um, reflectance, and they've calculated chlorophyll, and they see that actually they compare better to that. And they've gone even a step further. They're now assimilating the reflectance, which is a much better thing to assimilate than chlorophyll, because it has a much less of an error bar on it. So it's, that's really, really cool. And I had a few slides in it, but then I thought I wouldn't get back to my stuff. So um, well worth going looking at. If, if they are assimilating the, the model reflectance into the model. No, so they're, <laughs> they're, they're, assi they're assimilating uh, modus reflectance into their model. Yeah. All right. So there's another way that um, this could be useful to have all of this um, information in the model. I already showed that we could play around with um, looking at how the light field would change the uh, types of phytoplankton that lived there. Um, but there are other ways we can use the model to explore ocean color products. And what am I doing on time? How do I have till 10? Okay. Um, which is to ask, what are some of the uncertainties in the ocean color blue-green ratio chlorophyll. I already showed that it's different to my model chlorophyll. What can we say about it? Well, one of the things is the algorithm that's used by NASA or um, ESA um, to get that uh, blue-green reflectance ratio is based on a small number of, okay, not small, a large number, but not terribly well distributed in the world, a small number of, of uh, uh, simultaneous chlorophyll and radiometric observations. Right, so those coefficients, uh, sorry, I should put this in. These coefficients are found from a small number of data sets. Well, what happens if we had perfect knowledge? Well, let's first see. All right, so this dotted line is the, is the line that you get, is the um, uh, function that you get if you look at, this is the blue-green ratio and gets chlorophyll with just a small number of points. And there's the bias um, between the model reflectance-based and model in situ, right? So we model world completely now, Think, forget about the real world. So we see that it's um, highly, it's way too much in the, it, the re reflectance-based ratio um, suggests a lot less chlorophyll in the Southern Ocean and uh, maybe a little too much in the uh, mid-latitudes. But the model has perfect knowledge, right? So I can do the same thing with every single grid cell in my entire model and then ask what that, that reflectance, um, what that uh, uh, algorithm coefficient should be and they change. It's that solid line here. Okay, puzzlement, all right. Can I say that somehow differently? Okay, the coefficients that we use, the A's, 
to the, uh, um, are found in the real world, in the modus world, um, by just a few, pa a few um, data points in the real. If I subsample my model in exactly the same way as, sorry, as they are in this CBAS um, data set, those are the number of points I have, and that is the line that I would get. If I then use every single spot I have in the model, I can then calculate a different set of coefficients. And I, yep. Are those color coded by the bias of the original? Oh, sorry, I didn't put that on. Now, this is actually biased by, um, uh, no, bias. This is plotted, the red is, I think, between 20 south and 20 north. The light blue is, I think, 60, uh, 50 to 50. And then the others are the pole wood. Yeah, thank you for, I had to put that on there. Just to show you then in the, in the uh, where it's well sampled, it does actually quite well, but in, in the sort of, in these lower regions, the, the, um, uh, the algorithms do quite well. So this is, if I use all the data, I can get a bias that looks like this. It's better almost everywhere except in some regions. The bottom line to that is saying that that fourth order polynomial is never going to work completely, right? It shouldn't really, if we think about it, but um, even if you had perfect knowledge, you could not get a perfect um, uh, match between the reflectance ratio and chlorophyll. We also have perfect knowledge of everything else in the model. And that's perfect model knowledge of the model, not the real world model. So here are just some um, plots of model in situ chlorophyll, so the, the model real chlorophyll, against, um, in this case, the model CDOM and the model POC. And this is um, just the density of plots. So it means um, 7 here is 7%. And so it means about 3% of all the obs all the grid cells in my model fit into this little spot here. Makes sense. And so, again, I think everything, everyone knows this, but it's just a, 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 um, an illustration of it, um, that there is a lot of um, other optical constituents which cha will change how the water is responding, and therefore why a chlorophyll algorithm won't work perfectly. There are other things. There is a really nice correspondence between both in general, but there's huge clouds of things that, that make sense. Okay. Let's play another little game, though. In the model, we have all these optically different phytoplankton. This, again, is the model in situ chlorophyll, oh, against the model derived chlorophyll. Um, that would be the one-to-one -one line. Uh, sorry, it's the red again is the, is the lower latitudes, slightly higher latitudes and the highest latitudes, and we can see how off they are. How important is, is the fact that they're all optically different for the scatter? So what we do is we're going to rerun the model, but now with this black line, which is a generic um, absorption and a generic scattering. And then ask, can we make the algorithm better? And yes, we can indeed. So a lot of that scatter we're seeing here is the fact that the phytoplankton are optically different. And Colin might suggest that let's see that as an opportunity. Let's see that as a reason why we could actually, um, if we know that, if we know what this difference is, maybe it can tell us something about how um, to improve um, how we get um, chlorophyll or phytoplankton uh, functional types from space. Okay, this flagging, definite flagging. I think you all need to stop. Breathe a little. I'm just going to land up with that. All right, so you're going to hear more about that from Curtin. Not that particular thing, but about why we might want to put um, better light into into. Can we go back to the dependence of the chlorophyll on CDOM? One back. Yeah. yeah. So, with that, do you restrict that to the photic zone, or is that every grid point in the ocean? So, no, that's every grid cell in the top of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I had to make some assumption about what the, the satellite was seeing, and I decided it's a top 10 meters. So, yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually some fun things about what this means. Um, where we have um, high sedum and low chlorophyll. It actually turns out it's what causes this little tail here. And it's times when um, it's usually actually at the end of the summer when there's not much chlorophyll, and then the sedum starts getting mixed up, and it's 
the sedum gets bleached at the surface, so there's not much at the surface, but when you start stirring up stuff from <coughs> deep down, it's high in sedum, and so you get this mismatch, and that causes some mismatches here. And we observed that in real life. Great, thank you. <laughs> Are you able to look at the diurnal variation? So in this model, no, um, we're not. Um, it's actually one of the next projects I'm planning to do is to, to start looking at that, yeah. Exciting. So you run your model with a 24-hour average light? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll set them straight on that. <laughs> okay, thanks. I think we've covered that. I think we can skip on that. Okay, so this is what really I'm now going to kind of, I have my lo lo the last outline wrong. We're going to switch completely. Actually, we're not. I'm going to come back to some of this, but change of topics. Big breaths. You ready for another half hour? You can do it. All right. Okay, climate change. You've all seen an image like this many, many times, right? Increase in atmospheric CO2, an increase in ocean CO2. This is all taken from this one. This is from on a lower station, and then this is from ocean station a lower. All right. That's pretty serious. We know that. So models are being used to try and understand what will happen in the future. Um, so I'm going to call them climate models. Most of them include the atmosphere, some land, but they also include the ocean. Um, they're usually spun up for pre-industrial, so we get a real base of what the, real wo the, the model world is in a pre-industrial situation. And then it simulates up to the year 2100 with various scenarios of how the CO2 is going to change over the course of that time. Most of them are coarse resolution because to run for that long is tough. Um, it's, that's, you know, at least a... It could be as much as a 2,000 year simulation, and so it's expensive. Oops. And so these models, here's the very stretched Mauna Loa uh, product. And then this is what we might suggest is going to happen in the future if we take, if actually that's probably Paris, that one there. Paris Accord, but if we make some more significant changes to how we um, regulate carbon dioxide, maybe it would go to something like that. So there's a, a no policy scenario, or a policy as we have it at the moment scenario, and a, a real attempt to try and curb our carbon dioxide. So that's atmospheric PCO2. Sorry, did I skip a slide here? No, okay. Um, so here are some of the things that are going to happen to the ocean in a physical sense. The sea surface temperatures are going to change. They're going to get warmer, possibly in some regions as much as 5 degrees centigrade in a business-as-usual scenario, so if we don't make any changes. There's going to be a reduction in sea ice. So this is uh, the, the sea ice change in fraction. So when it's one, it means there's a total removal of ice completely. Um, a change in stratification. So the heating is mostly going to go into the top of the ocean. It's going to take a long, long time for that heat to make it into the deep ocean. And so we're going to get a separation of the top of the ocean from the bottom of the ocean. And that's bad. Why? Right, the nutrients at the bottom of the ocean. And so separating the two means less nutrients coming to the surface. There's going to be changing in the turning, overturning circulation as well, um, a, a reduction likely. And that, again, is important for the supply of nutrients because the overturning circulation, this is the difference, so, but the overturning circulation is bringing nutrients back up to the surface, and so if you slow it down, it's going to slow down the amount of nutrients that make it. Yep. Can you guess some, something about mesoscale circulation, like Adenis and Frons? Um, I actually don't know I, um, if anyone has done enough study, uh, studies on this. It sounds like something someone should do. Um, whether that increase in stratification will change, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It sounds like something that someone, if they haven't, should do, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess a lot of it is that the, up to now, the climate models have generally been coarse resolution, so they don't resolve mm -hmm. the mesoscale. But there's nothing to say someone couldn't do a run with a different stratification and um, you know, not do the full run, but could run it with one stratification and then one or another. I'm sure there must be a study out there. I d just don't know it. <laughs> but it's a, a super interesting, good question, actually, for 
these studies. Um, so some of these coupled models do have biogeochemistry. In fact, most of them do it now. Um, for, you know, about eight years ago, that might not have been true, but most of them now have some biogeochemistry. But they're particularly interested in the carbon, so they don't spend as much time on the ecosystem part of it. Um, because we're running thousands of years, it's really expensive. They tend to have only two, maybe three, maybe four phytoplankton types in them. And as far as I know, none of them resolve any optics, in, um, so there's no, no attempt to resolve the um, um, pigments or um, optical properties. Some of the most striking biogeochemical changes um, is this is 2000, and I'm showing um, pH up here, and this is PCO2 in the water, in the surface layer. That's 2100. It should be on a different color bar. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? We're going from this world to this world. And at least in terms of the open ocean, there's no place in the, in the open oceans that have that PCO2. There are coastal regions that do, so I mean, that's, it's, so we do have some ideas of what, the, the, what a high CO2 world would look like, but the open ocean's never seen that um, in the last time, many thousands of years. Um, so some of these coupled models have been used in the IPCC reports. Does anybody, does IPCC mean something to everyone? Right? Okay, I think everyone is nodding there. Okay. Um, Typically, they're called the couple of CMIT models, so it's a coupled model into comparison project, but that sort of lumps a bunch of models that can compare themselves to one another. And they've done several RCPs. RCPs mean anything to anyone? Uh, representative pathways, so suggestions of how carbon dioxide emissions are going to change over the years. So, a sort of the big, the, there's an RCP 8.5, which is basically there's no changes in um, policy, and so we just emit um, as much as possible. These models are available. The output from the last, which is the IPCC, um, the CMIP 5 models, are available. Their output is available, so you could get the carbon, the phytoplankton um, temperatures at various different sites. IPC, uh, CMIP 6 is just spinning up, and those also will be available um, if anyone is interested in them. So this is just to show a, comp uh, um, a mean of how these different CMIP models, CMIP 5 models, did looking into the future ocean what the primary production changes would be. Where it's blue, it means there's a change, a, a reduction in primary production. Where it's green, there's a suggestion that primary production might actually go up. The stippled regions are the places where the models, at least, I think there were 11 models, and at least nine of them agreed on the sign. Not the magnitude, just the sign. So what you might come away with that is actually we really don't know. And actually, these people would probably be very offended by my saying that, so I'll be careful. There is some agreement, but there is a lot of disagreement as well as what's going to happen in the future world. Um, in general, there is agreement that in a lot of the low latitudes where things are really nutrient limited, primary production will be reduced because of this increased stratification and the changes in the circulation that bring nutrients to the surface. It's a little more unclear what will happen in the higher latitudes. These are regions which are often not nutrient limited. In fact, they're quite often light limited, that the, the day length, I mean, the season is very short. And so if you increase stratification, you actually may increase primary production because there'll be longer periods where they can grow. Also, and I, I think I, we talked about the Epley curve yesterday, at warmer temperatures, um, organisms can grow faster, at least they're, they're um, and so there actually may be some growth, increase in growth rates um, increase in primary production because of a warmer world. They all fight against each other and I was going to, this is some, some work I've done looking at um, globally at what the different mechanisms might do. So if we just change um, uh, the nutrient supply, we get a reduction. So this is a reduction in primary production in percent. If we include warming, what the warming might do is so the fact things might grow faster in a warmer world. We might get an increase in primary production. I just threw that in because I wanted to say ocean acidification just once while we're here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe ocean acidification will actually lead to an increase in growth rates in some phytoplankton. Not all of them, but some of them. And so there may actually be an increase in primary production due to ocean acidification. What will the actual total primary production change be? 
Who knows? They might cancel each other out globally, not locally, but globally. Anyway, that's not what you're really interested in. Well, let's get back to ocean color a little bit. And I'm going to just uh, talk to you a little bit about this paper by Stephanie Henson, um, where she asked the question, how long do we need to wait before we see um, a real signature of climate change in um, ocean color? It's for, um, and here she's going to be looking at chlorophyll and primary production. So she's looking at the trend in chlorophyll and primary production between 1997 and 2007. And these are the trends. Um, in this one, it's milligrams per meter, um, meter cube per year. This is in milligrams per meter cube per day per year. The trend, so how much it's changing. Positive means it's increasing over those 10 years. Blue means it's decreasing in 10. And her question is, is this a signature of climate change? Well, a model can help with that. So she used three of those CMIP5 models. Actually, there was, might not have been my CMIP4 models, I think. Um, so three different models that had been run from pre-industrial all the way to 2100. And it had, they had primary production and they had chlorophyll in them. And she said, how long before she could really see a signal? How long before it became a significant signal above the interannual variability in the models? So one thing was to check that the models got a decent level of interannual variability. And then she used, um, um, actually I even forget what all of these is, but this is um, the variance that happens due to interannual variability. And these are the sorts of numbers she gets for how long it'll take from the beginning of a record before you would actually be able to say definitively, yes, that's an anthropogenic signal. The actual mean of all of this is about 40 years. There are some regions where it might show up much earlier, maybe 20 to 30 years. So how long have we had a signal of chlorophyll from the atmosphere? 1998, let's say, is start. So about 18 years. So in general, it's going to be tight to be able to say we can actually see a signal yet. So the take home from this is, on average, if for most of the ocean, it's going to be something about 40 years before we're actually going to see a signal. Um, climate models are going to be really important, therefore, because it's going to take a long time for us to see it. Let's use the models for something they use, can be used for. Um, and, uh, and another paper, um, this is uh, Claudie Bulu with Stephanie Henson also, um, looked at what happens if you stop the, the measurements. So for instance, if the next ocean color satellite, you know, I'm not going to say it, but if there wasn't an ocean color satellite for a little while, actually it sets it back and you would actually need something, I think it was 70 years, I forget the actual number, I don't know if anyone remembers, but much longer. And so that can be useful to the ocean color community, especially to people um, who are making decisions about whether to put another satellite up. Okay. Take a deep breath. And, and I think that the question of continuity is really critical because there are a lot of sensors in space that are ocean color sensors, but many of them require calibration to MODIS, <laughs> and MODIS is not going to be forever. And so if we are talking about those as being, you know, if that's a necessary requirement for continuity, then we need to be a little bit more nervous, I think, than we are right now <laughs> about continuity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really a tough question, actually, because, you know, you may have a much better way to say something about a long-term trend. Even with two, times, two satellite time series, which are disconnected in time, if you have done really an excellent job, you know, with all the calibration, vicarious calibration, everything, and certainty evaluation on the two, and you have done it consistently, and it, you might do even a, a better job like this than having an overlap between two missions and simply, you know, okay, well, I have this, let's, you know, make them consistent and, and, and that's, that's it. And then we look at the trend, you know, that well, there are plenty of, uh, yeah, things behind this that, and, and I have another comment on this is, and, you know, this, it's obviously a very difficult question for the model analysis, <coughs> sorry. Mm, I think most of the models just cannot reproduce, you know, this regime shift as sometimes happens, you know, because 
the, the idea of a trend, which is something, you know, which is going slowly increasing or decreasing over time, over 10, 20, 30 years, is okay, maybe one thing that happens. But sometimes with climate change or other change, you have suddenly a big shift in the, in the system. And then, and that means that maybe we can see something and say something a bit before the next 40 years, and that's maybe <laughs> Good for you to know that because you're <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> not discouraged and not uh, thinking you have to wait for the end of your career before you can say anything on uh, climate change. <laughs> and it, um, David, it's, it's an excellent yeah, a point to, to come back to the crudity of the models. Remember, these models usually have two phytoplankton. If they had a much wider range of phytoplankton, they might see much bigger shifts. Um, mm -hmm. Also, uh, it's a hundred years, I think, for phytoplankton cells is quite a long time. Yes. So maybe if it was possible to put some components like a phytoplankton adaptation or something, because mm -hmm. I remember with the components of forests, uh, there were these studies with uh, ocean acidification, and then people noticed that in a month they actually adapt. You know? So yeah. maybe yeah. can improve the model even yeah. to make it. Uh, definitely. Um, so you can only put into models what you know something about. Um, and I think those the um, long-term experiments, and there are now a bunch of experiments that have gone three, four, five years, just slowly ramping up the, the CO2 or the temperatures and seeing how things adapt. Um, so I think that's, that's new information that will in the future be in, brought into models. Yeah, very, very good point, yeah. What's the physical hydrodynamic model that you use here? So this, so in this particular study, it's um, not any of my models. I should be careful about that. Um, and I'm, I have actually a few more slides on some work that I've done. But um, in this study with Stephanie Henson, it was three different models she looked at. Um, and these are, these are coupled models. So they're being forced by an atmosphere that's itself changing. Um, they're the typical Navier-Stokes equations. I mean, they're, they're um, um, yeah, but you know, there's like, they're Princeton Ocean model yeah, and it's so ROMs and it's... So this, this one will be MOM. Okay, um, it's, the, it's ROMs. the Princeton model. Uh, this will be MOM. I mean, it's not ROMs, it's MOM. Um, this one is, what is uh, the Piscus, um physical model? Um, NEMO, thank you, NEMO. Um, and this is going to be the uh, community model. I think the base is MOM for that as well. Okay, one more little piece, do it. So I've used my model, which uses the MIT GCM, um, as a, and they're relatively similar, the models. And I have gone out into the future with this model that I've been talking about. Um, and I've looked at the chlorophyll changes, and these are the trends in, the chlorophyll, cha in chlorophyll over the 100 years in a business as usual, so the worst case scenario. Um, this is in percent, I think, so it's, you know, a 1% change per year um, decrease, which over 100 years is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've done some trend analysis to say that only 53% of the ocean actually shows a statistical uh, trend over the, year, over the 100 years. Um, most of it's negative, some of it's positive. Okay, but I can calculate reflectance. I have reflectance all the way out to 2100. So I can use like an OC4 reflectance algorithm to calculate chlorophyll. Just looking at two places. The black is what's really happening. So that's my state variable. It's the chlorophyll that's inside the phytoplankton. They're changing. This particular region, it's changing quite a lot. You do get a little bit of a, a, um, a regime shift, if you want to say, in this particular version. Uh, this one's not changing as much as maybe increasing a little in that region. The red, that's the derived one. So that's what the OC4 would do. And it's not doing the same thing. And it's not doing the same thing. It's not biased one way or the other. It's showing a bigger increase there and le less of an increase there. I mean, less of a decrease there. Any guesses as to why? This actually is work that I'm just doing, so I don't actually have the plots to show you, but I can tell you what I think, but any guesses? Sorry? No. <laughs> well, why, why, is, why is the, um, the OC4 not the best? Um, I mean, why does it not tell us exactly what chlorophyll is? 
It's a proxy. Are there other things in the water? So CDOM, particulate matter, it's probably also changing in this world. As you stratify, CDOM's going to change a little bit. And so the algorithm which is, is tuned for today <coughs> is not going to be the right algorithm that you did for the 100. So you could maybe tune the model here and get it looking better, and you could have a new set of coefficients there and have them looking the same, but you can't use the same algorithm all the way through to the 2100. And I think um, Colin and Julia both talked about this as well. As the world changes, the different constitutes that come are in one place are going to change, and so you can't use the same um, empirical connections between things for today and tomorrow and later in, in the century. I think that's what I just said. So a summary. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen in the future. We've got models that can help us. But as David said, we need to also be careful that the models don't necessarily represent all the processes that are happening and so minimize things. But they can be useful. And models which link close to ocean colour products are therefore going to be able to give us a little more information about what might happen in the future in ocean colour products. So, you know, as the next set of, of ocean colour product um, satellites go up, um, what, ca what can they and can they not tell us? Had I, I had algorithms, I mean, um, terminology before, so acronyms, I think we went through all of those, but if there's something you don't immediately see, ask me. No? Okay. Then I'm going to finish. This is my model again. This is true color, using the reflectance. Um, there's a distinct problem between the modeling community and the ocean color community and how we connect, um, especially understanding the uncertainty in both of, the, uh, both of our products and the model, how you might understand the model pro um, uncertainties and how the modelers understand the ocean color community. But there are new models that are trying to bridge that gap. And I suspect there will be more as we go along. For me, it's incredibly exciting. I'm showing you work that I'm just working on. And that's because there actually isn't much other work out there that's doing this sort of thing. And Kurt is going to be showing you some of the work that he's doing. Um, so it's a new field. We have reflectance in our models. They're imperfect. But there's stuff we can start pulling out from them. Um, the models can be a laboratory if you want to think about your pet um, interest. Is there something in this model that you could then use to see, hey, I have perfect knowledge. If I had perfect knowledge, what could I work out and what could I not? Okay, that's it. Thanks. Do you have questions? Yeah. So I assume that when you did your projection, your forecast, you were able to resolve not just changes in chlorophyll, but changes in distribution of different, the different phytoplankton yeah. groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, What's the story? <laughs> in general, um, and with most models, what tends to happen is with reduction in nutrients, it's the smaller phytoplankton that actually, um, it's not that they win out, there's a decrease everywhere, but the bigger things die off more than the little things. So there's a shift to smaller communities. An expansion of gyres. Expansion of gyres, yeah. yeah. Um, though there are some interesting twists there because um, phytoplankton are limited by multiple nutrients. And so, in, for instance, one of the um, simulations I have, some parts become very much more nitrogen limited than they were before and suddenly there's a lot of excess iron that is then drifted into another place and, and those things, you know, I can see them in the model. I wouldn't actually say this is what's going to happen. I'm just going to say these are processes that we don't know yet. And so, yes, probably the electrophic gyres will increase, but there's this chance that as you switch nutrient limitations, there might be different changes. Um, I, I was wondering whether there's um, sort of capacity to use this to help identify areas. So, so this is sort of tied into, um, you know, recalibrating um, remote sensing or reflectance. So in the future, we're going to kind of recalibrate all various algorithms. And so there's, you know, um, papers in the last few years where they've uh, classified optical water targets based on reflectance spectra and kind of associated a certain uncertainty and, and mapped that. Mm -hmm. Is it pos possible to incorporate that into your kind of projected reflectance so we could 
you know, figure out where we should, you know, target future um, calibration efforts or something like that? Yeah. Is, is that in it, progress? It, it, or? Um, not that part. So what I have actually done, I showed you how I, um, and I think I lost everyone, so I'm sorry. Um, what I played with the reflectance, how you made that OC4 type um, ratio, and I said, what happens if you used all the data and you made a global um, thing? You can also do it at each grid point. You can say, I take all the information for 15 years and have an algorithm for each location. And it does much better that way. So it's accepting the fact that there's uncertainties in different optical things. A step I haven't done, but I think it's a really nice idea, is how does that classification change in each location? And are some of them changing more than others? I think that would be, thank you. <laughs> that would be a cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's just something I was thinking about uh, because this is more chlorophyll based, right? So it's a surface chlorophyll based, let's say. Is there anything that considers uh, photoacclimation, for instance, like in the gyres? Because when you look at seasonality, you see more chlorophyll in the winter, but it's actually just photoacclimation. It doesn't mean there's more biomass, it's a big area. So is there anything in the model that can compensate? So, so, well, so the model will have the same thing. Okay, so in, in, the, in the gyres in the winter, yes, the chlorophyll will go up. Since we also have the biomass, we can actually see what that is. Um, it's not something I've looked at specifically, though I know it happens in the model. Um, so yes, the model could be a really useful tool to sort of see when chlorophyll is an increase in biomass, a change in chlorophyll is a change in biomass, and when it's just a change in, um, in physiological state, yeah. Um, very, very definitely, um, and that goes with depth too. I and mean, don't forget, the model is 3D. So I have, and actually, I never, never, uh, I did. I show you the deep chlorophyll maximum. We you know we definitely get a deep chlorophyll maximum. So you can see, you think, oh, everything's down there. But when you look at the biomass, it's much more homogeneous through the the water mass. So the fact it's got both pieces in, I think, is the yeah, it's important. Uh, I, I just wonder how many of you. Uh, Heard about this new, because you know the normal way of validating or models and looking at chlorophyll, and now many people say, no, we just should not do this and generate the reflectance from the model, exactly what you have seen, and, and validate directly from the satellite reflectance. Because that's something which is now being put forward more and more as a much better way than doing with chlorophyll. And I encourage you to think to this a bit more because there are plenty of uh, um, assumptions behind this. Personally, I'm not sure we're doing any, any better with this, but anyway, <laughs> so the, I could, yeah. we could speak about that. But I, because, I mean, you know, I, that's what is put forward at the moment. Let's do this, that would be much better. I think, I think, it, needs, I think it needs to go both ways. I, I, I kind of poo pooed at the beginning that we should use carbon from satellite. Um, Although we've kept saying that, what we really want from the ocean color community is carbon. So what we're doing is going the other way around. I think it needs both pieces need to be done. Um, so um, yes. Okay. okay. Well, thank, you. thank you.